The Future Sport Podcast is brought to you by 3Advance, developers of sports tech apps that are AI-powered and UX-focused. So if you're looking to create some apps for your startup or your sports biz calls for some artificial or business intelligence, you should check out 3Advance. They're incredible. Go to 3Advance.com. That's the number 3Advance.com. Empire. This decade, it's the one where betting changes sports. Doing a national broadcast, you have your brand exposed to people in California and Florida and Texas, which is great, but they're not quite, again, you can activate at the moment. So um, we've been very tactical um, in how we've spent. That's Johnny Aiken, CEO of PointsBet USA. As the markets open, the race to attract customers goes into hyperdrive. This is the Future Sport Podcast. I'm Bram Weinstein. We are going to talk about how betting operators are working through the various hurdles that is legalized sports betting, how they go about gaining a foothold in a quickly expanding competitive space, and how we might watch sports thanks to the analytics provided by the book operations with Johnny Aitken in a minute. Plus, the Chicago Bulls are the latest franchise to leverage their brand to find new entrepreneurs in and out of the sports tech space. So they are looking ahead, but maybe no one is having to have the real hard talk about how their sport will fundamentally change than NASCAR. And the future is soon, where the roar may one day be a thing of the past. A piece of Americana roared into the 2020s. The Daytona 500 got delayed by rain, but the race had the advantage of a holiday weekend. And considering the president showed up for it, it is fitting that it's happening on President's Day. We profiled the tech in the sport last summer on a trip to Sonoma, but we did not address was the potential to go from pure gas and oil model engines to hybrids or even eventually electric. Liz Clark is following that for The Washington Post. Hey, Liz, how are you? I'm great, Bram. Thanks for having me. Um, hybrid engines, is that actually going to happen soon? Soon, maybe, you know, four or five years. But um, in two years, they're going to take a baby step. Um, the automakers switch for NASCAR now are Ford, Chevy, and Toyota are very eager and very bullish, um, understandably, that the cars on the racetrack really resemble and more than resemble, but have key things in common with the passenger cars they're building, selling, and anticipate selling more of. And this means either a hybrid, hybrid electric, all electric component. So the the initial baby step is going to be to stay with the internal combustion engine, which is a V8 push rod engine that really is is quite retro, as, as all car people know. Um, but so to keep that, because that makes the sound that is – such a, um, a core part of the appeal of, of stock car racing for, for most people. So keep that, but add um, a hybrid component that would capture energy from braking and store it in a battery and make it available for use by the driver in the form of this like extra jolt of horsepower to pull off like a super fast path. So so obviously, if you think that's through, that's not going to save any um, emissions, reduce emissions, save any gas. It's an add-on, but you get that hybrid technology in the car, and then you know, ideally, you you rebuild an engine from scratch that would that would be one hybrid engine. This does sound like, that though, that, that there's a competitive balance issue if they were to allow that to happen, as whoever could figure out the supercharged battery would have an advantage over the ones that didn't have that if they were allowed to use it in specific moments in a race. Well, I mean, that's a really intriguing question, and it's it's not a given that that's what they're going to do, but I, the signs kind of point to that. So um, not to get too geeky about this, you – if so the energy available to this battery again comes from braking 
so common sense tells you, well, that's really useless at Daytona Talladega or any mile and a half super speedway. So this really comes into play at short tracks like Martinsville. So that gives you the heat and in turn the energy that goes into the battery. And then um, the hope is that it would produce these bursts of as much as 100 extra horsepower. And you don't have unlimited. You might have certain, op- you know, like six opportunities to push this button and get the, the jolt. And um, so, you know, I mean, I was wondering about this too, because, you know, the, the smartest racers really know that uh, the key to winning on short tracks and road courses, a big part of that is tire management. So that means not over braking, but in this technology, would it mean that, you know, that you'd want to like, use the brakes more if that means you can stockpile more heat and more energy and if we had uh, an expert um you know crew chief on here who could help us i'm sure they could elevate the discussion but that, that's from the, the the earnest reporter's best understanding of of how this would work but uh, it, it does seem like it, what it does stem from actually is consumer related that the teams yeah. will do this if more cars get sold on the market that involve this technology, and that's why they haven't incorporated it into the pa- in the past. Well, I mean, there's there's you know NASCAR, as you know, is not considered a pioneer in technology. I mean, at every turn for decades, they tend to use the fast, which is um, accomplishes two things: it keeps the cost low for teams, which is a good thing, and it connects with the average person with the average car who wants to pop open the hood and work on their engine. Now, th- those are kind of things of nostalgia. People don't do that as much um, these days with fuel injection as they used to way back in the day. You know, it's it's more unusual to, to speak to the guy who changes his own oil or the young woman who changes her own oil rather than goes to Jiffy Lube and tunes the engine and does the, the plugs and points and all that. What is driving this is not like NASCAR wants to be a pioneer in in green technology. It's that Ford, Chevy, Toyota are kind of understandably reminding them, hey, you know, your cars have to resemble what we sell. We're not in this just to parade around as a billboard. There has to be some connection. And fans aren't, aren't so naive that simply slapping a decal on a stock car that says Ford as opposed to a decal that says Toyota, that's not enough to really distinguish our brand and to show that our brands perform. Like 10, 20 years ago, you could say Toyota's goal was to show that um, the Prius could extend your gas tank. You know, the whole, the whole message, the consumer message of the Prius was you can go farther on a tank of gas. Well, these days, that's the message people want to send selling these cars. I mean, that's a good message, but they, they now want to sell the message that a hybrid can kick ass. You know, you can actually, um, you know, merge onto the Beltway without getting run over. You know, this could be a performance car. This can um, win a race. You know, they want that sex appeal of hybrids aren't just to putt along in the slow lane. They, they're pretty cool. Yes, of course, this is being driven by consumers of today and what car makers know about consumers of tomorrow. And anybody who has kids that are 18 to 20 to 22 will probably tell you, you know, my kids are not begging me for a driver's license. They, they don't really care about that. In fact, they're not obsessing about their first car. They don't see the point of even owning a car. So, yeah, you're right. It is being driven by consumers and what car makers know about where consumers are going to be in three, five years, 10 years. Um, uh, geez, you know, if like a high performance electric maker like Tesla wanted, ever wanted to get involved, if they've ever let them into the club, it'd be interesting to see how that would alter the landscape of NASCAR, too, if an all electric vehicle oh, yeah. would, would come into it. Yeah. All right. I'll let you go with this because you, you brought this up and I do think it is a very big deal. The noise is part of the nostalgia of the whole thing. And if you bring in electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles, it will mitigate a lot of the noise that the engines make. What do you think NASCAR does about what could be noise elimination? You know, that is the real sort of romantic question that fascinates me the most. I cannot fathom 
NASCAR selling tickets to something that hums, you know, that doesn't roar. So I don't know really what you do. I can't imagine that you'd do some fake piping in of a roar. For now, the noise will be very much a part of it because they're not doing away with the V8. They're just adding the hybrid component. But um, what is the end game? I mean, do you do we ever see a time culturally where, you know, our society, much in the way we regarded smoking, you know, it used to be glamorous, a very cool thing to do. Now you're kind of a pariah if you smoke. Could it ever be that, uh, you know, culturally the sound of burning of fossil fuels, that, that throaty sound becomes you know, bad, you know, something people don't want to hear. Right now, it's it's a, it's music. It's like heavy metal music <laughs> to a lot of people, and they love it. You know, that's the thrill. Liz Clark from the Washington Post. Thank you so much, Liz. Thanks, Bram. Up next, Johnny Aiken, CEO of PointsBet USA on gambling's certainties and the few hanging chads still to get through. This is the Future Sport Podcast. <laughs> Our guest this week is Johnny Aitken, who's the CEO of Points Bet USA. This is a Australian-based global sportsbook operator, but they've made their way into the U.S. markets and just landed a new, huge, multi-year partnership with the NBA as an authorized sports betting operator for that league. Hey, Johnny, how are you? I'm great. How are you? Uh, talk about what the partnership is. What are you doing with the National Basketball Association? Um, you know, we always entered into it you know, into our sort of discussions with the NBA with a view that um, we wanted to, I guess, do a deal that extracted some value for both sides of the fence and elevated ultimately the uh, viewing experience for clients that watch NBA. Um, So our deal in nature is an authorised betting operator deal, um, which is similar to what other operators have struck with the NBA, which gives us the right um, to use team logos and designations on our site to buy ad, you uh, you know, assets in and around live broadcast to do team and stadium deals Um, but on top of that and and the most exciting part in you know our eyes of the deal um, is the win the win win probability metric which um, is the first of its kind um, in America and what that means is that um, within the NBA platform to start with on NBA.com for pre-game and in-game stats visualizations there'll be a win percentage probability on the uh, the likelihood of a team winning. So um, think of a game where the odds are set at $1.95 or sort of, you know, well, minus 105 either way on the money line. Uh, the, win, the win probability in that instance would be 50 cent, 50% either way. So will that offer the opportunity for bettors to then in-game place wagers on how the game is progressing? I think... You know, I think that's to come. I think the aim of the probability metric is just to simplify odds. And in a market that's as nascent as the US, um, a lot of the apps and experiences that are coming from Europe um, are very full on. You know, they're, they're experiences that have been built for a very sort of mature better. And in America, we you know need to be cognizant that, you know, why well, not everyone's been betting for 50 years. Not everyone knows what minus 110, minus 120 means. And this is a way to simplify odds and get people in a in a nice way sort of educated on betting, get them comfortable with what percentages mean compared to odds, and hopefully over time get them interested in betting in NBA. That's that's really interesting that you put it that way because there, clearly there are a lot of people in the United States who have bet legally and, and probably illegally for a number of years, but now that the laws have changed, all of this has changed as well. And yet, um, we're described here as kind of immature in understanding the mechanics of it. Can can you dive a little deeper into, into what you mean of what you've learned about the U.S. better so far? Listen, I think there's, again, different types of better. Obviously, there is a mature better here that's been betting offshore for a long time, and they're very familiar with all, all, all of the products and all of the odds and all of the betting lingo um, that comes with sports betting. But the mass market, um, you know, haven't been exposed Um sports betting and 
you know, even myself coming from Australia, um, you know, moving from sort of sort of decimal odds to, you know, you, you know, these American odds where you're trying to compute what minus 400 means and what plus 330 means and what a teaser is and what um, minus five and a half spread line is versus minus three and a half and the odds on that, it, it is very confusing. And unless you're a, a really talented sort of mathematician, um, I, I think it's a real job and focus of the sports books to, again, sort of educate people. You know, we did that from our launch with the Darrell sort of Rebus Betting Academy, which is a very sort of sort of simplified way of sort of walking people through key markets and what they mean, you know, walking through our unique product points betting. And we've sort of, I guess, you know, you know, moved that up to another level now with the win probability metric powered by the NBA, again, on their platforms. Um, as said, you know, it'll be available on NBA.com um, in a few months' time. And, you know, we'd hope that, again, over time, it's adopted and sort of rolled out over more sort of imagery. Um, could you talk about relationships with the broadcasters themselves and, and how you see that functioning now in this new environment? Uh, it's a pretty fractured environment, to be honest. Um, coming from Australia and also working in the European markets, um, deals with broadcasters in some aspects are a lot more cleaner and easier to construct because you know operators in Europe, operators in Australia are getting licensed at a federal level. So any ad spend that you're doing above the line, it's touching every corner of the country that you're operating within. Uh, within the US, obviously, um, sports betting is a state-by-state -state decision and for the time being you know you have x amount of states live so doing a national broadcast you have your brand exposed to people in california and florida and texas which is great but they're not quite again you can activate at the moment so um we've been very tactical um in how we've spent you know we went live in new jersey um at the start of january uh, 2019 and that was the first state that we went live in um, and we've been very targeted in that state on really sort of digital assets. New Jersey is a funky market where New York supplies the north of Jersey with the bubble line media and Philadelphia supplies the south of Jersey with the bubble line media. And if you're not operating in Pennsylvania or New York, you have huge, huge amounts of spillage. So, um, you know, you really need to think very sort of strategically through the uh, landscape here and especially the sort of media landscape. So around the broadcast, you know, a lot of national deals, you do have this spillage factor and you know, obviously these deals come with a huge cost, so you you one need to think through that. So today we we've been very tactical and probably shied away from doing a lot of sort of TV spend in New Jersey. You know, but as as we get into markets such as Indiana and Illinois and Michigan, which are three states that we're looking to launch this year, you know, there there are markets that have clean sort of media DMAs, and as such, you know, you you will see the points bet brand um, on sort of TV, and we will obviously want to be in and around live broadcast that's where our sort of consumers are and that's what we want to target and we we're we're hopeful of again sort of you know you know working with broadcasters to bring to life the win probability metric and other types of digital initiatives i want to talk about some other technology with you to see how it sits with with your models and how you are dealing with these new markets and that's 5g um what does that mean for controlling um the quality and uh, of the of the games that you're offering yeah, I think speed speeds everything. Speed wins. Um, every consumer study you look at from Europe, um, Australia, and now the US early days, really speed and ease of use is what is what the consumer wants. Obviously, price and promotions, for instance, are very important at times, but ultimately having the fastest and easiest app to use um, is key. Uh, we uh, just released a new version of our app, which is probably a three to four X upgrade from our former app in terms of speed and ease of use. And it's the fastest app in market. When that sort of, I guess, translates to 5G, um, it's also well and good to, for our points to have this fast app, but if our clients are in a poor coverage area in a stadium with 4G where 20,000 people are also trying to log into the network, um, they're going to face you know, load issues and things as such. So 5G for operators is, is really important to unlock that and to make sure, especially for points bet, that our sort of great work is matched with a great sort of connection. And then in terms of in play betting, as you'd know, um, you know, the prices are updating every two, three seconds. So again, speed, speed, speeds everything and having the, the 5G, again, connection means that, especially for clients that are in stadium watching games, um, that they're served the latest odds and they're getting their bets on as quickly as possible. 
Uh, I want to go back to the league for a moment. Um, Adam Silver, the commissioner of the NBA, has been very forward thinking about this. There is a sports op- book operation that's going to open at the Wizards and Capitals facility under Ted Leonsis. So there are some owners that are embracing this. And then I think there are other leagues that are being a little more careful about it. Can you kind of survey the American sports leagues and who's being open about this, who's being guarded, and how you think this will all play out over the next few years? I think in the media there's been a bit of a beat-up, um, a little bit about the leagues and their sort of um, uh, the way they're sort of handling this. You know, I've had active conversations with all the big four pro sports leagues here and they've been fantastic. Obviously, the NBA were the first out of the gate with Adam Silver's letter. Um, you know, we've obviously struck a deal first with the NBA, so we work very closely with them. Um, NBA for us is a very important sport, not only in the US market, but in Australia, it's the fastest growing sport. You know, 10 years ago, NBA would have made up 0.5% or under of overall handle. It now sort of makes up around 25%. So it's great. It's a very important league to us globally. And then as it comes to NFL, MLB and NHL, you know, they're all charting their own course, but they're doing it in the right way. They're very collaborative. You know, we hoped to announce similar deals over time to what we've announced with NBA, but it's very important for us as an operator that we are extracting value and it's not simply a deal that gives us um, the right to use team, you know, what logos and things like that. There has to be added value, which ultimately drives people um, to bet on NHL over French soccer or to bet on MLB over English tennis. And, and that's what we're driving with the leagues, and they've been very sort of receptive to that. Um, what do you think of the, the concept of integrity fees? Do you think that will end up going anywhere for leagues or, or if the federal government were to get involved and get behind something like that? Well, I think, obviously, we need to acknowledge that there is an active offshore market, and it's an offshore market that isn't policed in terms of what sort of people are betting on, um, what what trends are happening within college basketball games, within player props and things like that. So it's obviously a very clear argument that bringing that activity offshore, allowing operators to compete on price and promotion uh, by not imposing onerous tax schemes or onerous fees to be an authorised operator is really important. Um, and again, that's the narrative that we've been discussing with the league for a long time. And the NBA, again, in particular, have been very sort of responsive to that. Um, last thing I want to ask you about is second screen experience going back to the broadcast models. We've talked to a lot of different groups, and obviously all of the major purveyors of content are looking for opportunities here. And it seems to be seamless for gambling or fantasy or all those applications to work within the context of a second screen to what is a traditional broadcast. How do you see your role in potentially being part of those type of experiences? I probably view it at the moment that the second screen experience is obviously the focus and the sort of relevance for all sort of US sports, both college and pro. It's gonna be very hard for operators to do streaming deals um, and get those broadcasts again within the app. Uh, We have heard obviously that the NHL via IMG Arena are looking at um, allowing operators, sports betting operators within America to do deals to stream NHL games again within the app. But I'm a huge proponent of again, proponent of what's been, you know, again, happening in Australia, which is a very mature betting market where, you know, uh, operators have done deals with the likes of Perform, um, IMG, and we stream sports such as tennis and soccer, again, within the app. And you have this experience where the top of your screen is the game and the bottom of the screen is the odds. And the odds are always changing. And the client, again, you know, but doesn't have to have two sort of devices um, to use, they can use one. So that's how we're sort of looking at it. We're looking at it as, sort of single screen focus for non no US sports and then for US sports to your point yeah I do see that as a sort of second screen uh, strategy and we're sort of iterating around that Johnny Aiken is the CEO of Point Bet USA thanks so much for joining us Johnny thank you thanks for having me up next Matt Kobe vice president of business strategy and analytics with the Chicago Bulls and Dr. Naveen Goyle CEO of Loud Capital on the latest co-venture to find the next great startup this is the Future Sport Podcast. So let's take a minute here to thank our friends at 3 Advance. These guys are ranked one of the nation's top app developers, but that's not all. 
They've helped grow a bunch of sports tech startups like Team Builder, T-Box Tour, and In-Game Fantasy. But they're also experts in user experience, cloud APIs, and artificial intelligence. So if you're looking for a dev partner to bring your future sport tech to life, look these guys up. Go to 3advance.com. They're the team to make it happen. At Advance, you will. That's the number 3advance.com. And tell them Future Sport sent you. Our guests this week are Dr. Naveen Goyal, the CEO and co-founder of Loud Capital, and Matt Kobe, who's the Vice President of Business Strategy and Analytics for the Chicago Bulls. And they have announced their 20 semifinalists for their Entrepreneur Pitch Competition. Great to have you both here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank hey, you for having me. Hey, Matt, let, let's talk about from the Bulls' perspective, why did you want to reach out to startups and tech-forward entrepreneurs to try to have a competition with them? Yeah, I mean, I, listen, we, we saw what was happening in Chicago with the um, entrepreneur scene. There's, I have a lot of friends in the space, um, and we know that there's a lot to gain from learning about the startup community and what technology is emerging, whether it's in sports or just more broadly um, sports and entertainment. And so we've always wanted to tap into that market. We just haven't had the, an easy way to do it. And so um, this opportunity with Loud, we thought, was the perfect way to um, get access to that community. Um, we wanted to go into that community in a very authentic way. We didn't want it to feel like we were in, intruding or, or coming into their space. And so by partnering with Loud and, and going through this competition, um, it's allowed us to educate ourselves on the space, but also you know, ultimately will give us visibility into you know, 20 amazing companies that are coming through this process. And Dr. Goyle, for you, what was attractive about the opportunity to do this? Well, when we opened up our office in Chicago, um, it was a, a pleasant call that we got from the Chicago Bulls saying, you know, we internally approved a, uh, a venture type competition. And, you know, would you be able to help us, you know, run it and, and really engage the community? Uh, and, you know, really our, our bread and butter is to in, engage the community, uh, encourage and educate on entrepreneurship, um, and vet various companies that we uh, sometimes invest in. So um, it really was a natural thing for us to do, but with a uh, global legacy um, organization. So it's uh, it was really one of the dream calls that we got, and, and getting to know the Bulls uh, much closer uh, than even a year ago, um, it's been a, such a great organization, very progressive, um, and it's been fun. So. So, yeah, it's, it was a no-brainer for us. Um, Dr. Goyle, so Matt had mentioned what's happening in Chicago. C could you kind of elaborate on what you see from your end happening in Chicago with startups, entrepreneurs, and tech? Absolutely. And, and first of all, love Chicago. I lived here uh, in Chicago for four years uh, during my uh, medical training, and so always loved the city. Um, it's been a huge startup entrepreneurial city for a for, for a long time and the ecosystem is very active it's been uh, for a while we've seen that we've invested in a few companies prior um, so we were very aware how uh, great an opportunity it was um, but I think just like many other communities that we've seen and been a part of um, there's always a, a greater activation that could be there and so we see so many independent whether it's venture capital firms incubators um, individual entrepreneurs and how can you build something that brings them together and even know that they exist in various buildings right chicago is a large city and does everyone uh know about each other are they able to connect in various ways so we saw that as a huge opportunity once again with a, a legacy brand of the chicago bulls to activate the community that already exists to another level and i feel like we've we've helped do that we've seen it uh, we've gotten great feedback uh, we've made some great partnerships uh, and hope that th this competition really is a spectrum of a movement to further activate the community. So, Matt, we've talked to some other franchises. Uh, the 49ers have been very active. Obviously, the Warriors have. Even the Packers have a, a title town type incubator type community. The 76ers Devils group, too. Um, are, are you or the Bulls looking at this at becoming an incubator type arm franchise? I wouldn't go that far yet. Um, I think what we wanted to do was, you know, use this as a way to 
again, not only introduce ourselves and get educated on, on the market, but also expose our, our staff internally as to what the power of some of these partnering with some of these companies could be. I think, you know, we, the season gets going and we all get very busy and it's really hard to kind of keep a pulse on things that are happening outside of sport. And so, you know, we saw this as a way to also educate our staff internally and, you know, who knows down the road what what may become. But I think in the short term, we're focused on, you know, collaborating with Loud throughout this venture, hopefully for, for many years to come and, um, you know, continuing to make an impact on these startups. I think that's the, Naveen touched on it, but I think that's the, the beauty of this competition is just some of the the exposure that these companies will get and, and it almost puts them on a, a different level relative to maybe some of their peers that are trying to do the same thing. And so whether, the, you know, whoever wins or, or doesn't win, um, already these 20 semifinalists have already gotten kind of, you know, recognition and notoriety through um, just making it to the semifinal. How many groups came to you? How many wanted to be part of it? Over over 150 is the is the last number we checked. And we ended up, uh, you know, screening various ones out. They had to be from Chicago land, et cetera. Um, but uh, one of the things that was really interesting was the level of engagement because everyone had to submit a pitch deck, a video. And so it was really cool to see um, how many people were engaged, uh, even outside of the Chicago land area. Was this all, did you want this all to be sports tech based? Were, was the competition open to anybody who had a good idea? How did you guys kind of formulate what you wanted to have happen here? Yeah, I mean, I think we, in terms of the first round, we intentionally kept it somewhat broad because we didn't want to, we didn't want to screen anybody out right out of the gate or people read the description of what we're looking for and say, well, my company doesn't really fit that description. And so we kept it intentionally broad with the hope of getting a lot of applicants and then you know we ultimately leaned on loud to to evaluate um those companies and who makes kind of the final cut to the semifinals but in the end i think what you see is you have you know some personal fitness you have mobile food ordering you have games you have education um you have video related services and so i think you have a nice wide spectrum of companies that um ultimately ultimately made it to the semifinals and i think that's that's exactly what we wanted. I don't think we went into this saying we really want to, you know, just companies for this specific need. I think what we wanted to see was there are a lot of different companies that touch sports and entertainment in a lot of different ways. And so mm-hmm. let's keep it broad and ultimately find, um, you know, the best companies that we want to move forward. For you, Naveen, how, how is this different than the typical day-to-day where groups are probably coming to you and submitting what they're doing and hoping to get venture capital out of you? Yeah, so it was it was unique because um, it all leads up to uh, a competition in an event, which, you know, usually is not the case. Uh, there was a timeline to it. Um, obviously, you know, press and media and, uh, once again, a, a legacy brand that's in the spotlight doing this entrepreneurial um, competition where, you know, entrepreneurship is extremely uh, broad and global right now, um, especially with the young folks. I feel like there's a whole empowerment movement and entrepreneurship is definitely, uh, I personally see as a vehicle to empowerment and, and ownership. So, I mean, for us, it was, it was different in the sense of the spotlight and the timeline and the competition um, but with regards to the diligence uh, and the way we look at uh, various ways to invest uh, was, was very similar. So there was a comfort level, but then there was a, a level of excitement being in an um, open spotlight. Matt, was there anything you were, you were hoping to see or expectations to see or things that you thought would be particularly attractive to the Bulls? As it relates to the company specifically or just broadly the competition? Really broadly the competition. When you decided to do this, did you guys have any idea of what type of companies would be attractive to an NBA franchise? Not explicitly. I think, you know, certainly we have companies that reach out to us throughout, um, you know, throughout the, the course of a season with certain types of technology. And, and in the end, they're trying to make their, their way into sport. And, you know, most of the time we, we hear and talk to those companies to see what sort of product they have. But I think what this did was it allowed us to um, be part of a, of a different process. I think in the end, if, you know, the companies that make it and ultimately the company that wins, if there's an opportunity for the Bulls to use them, I think that would be great. But at the end of the day, I think through this competition, what we wanted to do was really try to impact, um, you know, this, this company and these set of companies and allow them to, to take the next step in their, um, you know, business life cycle. And I think that was really the goal for us, um, you know, I think these 20 companies are incredibly strong. I mean, I'm 
I'll be part of the um, the next set of activities next week where we'll hear the pitches from all 20 of these companies. So I'll get to know them a little bit better than I know them today. But I think in the end, so far, from our standpoint, this has been um, an immense success, and I'm looking forward to the next few weeks um, ultimately getting to March 10th. Were any of the players involved, or do any of the players want to be involved um, with either the selection process or potentially investment in any of these groups? You know, I mean, I think right now we're, in terms of kind of judging in the process, we're going to have Bulls representatives be a part of that. Um, and so we're, we're still finalizing who that may be. So uh, right now, no, um, but we're, we're still finalizing who those list of folks will be. Um, Naveen, you said you guys have reach all over the country, likely the world. Um, are, are you looking at trying to replicate this with, with other franchises off of what has happened here? Um, so I would say we're not looking to replicate it. Um, we're obviously having fun. We, we have a presence in Chicago, love the community. Uh, we're very hands-on and believe you should have boots on the ground to do something like this. Again, a whole level of community engagement. So to answer your question, there have been um, teams that have reached out um, and we're, we're discussing various things, but uh, we're not actively looking to do this. It's, it is a lot of work and it's been fun, but it just needs to make sense for both sides. Um, the, uh, the team or the, the I should say the entity that reaches out, um, they need to have an alignment with what we believe in. And, and again, us and the Bulls have been completely aligned on our goals and, and how we do business and how we kind of think very, uh, I would say, forward thinking. Um, so, yeah, not actively looking, but um, had some very interesting calls um, from around the way. And, and to me, that's just great that there's a hunger to do something like this, like these, this kind of partnership um, to kind of in- engage the community. So um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for a lot of different organizations. It's really cool. It's a great opportunity for a number of these groups, specifically out in the Midwest. Dr. Naveen Goyle is the CEO and co-founder of Loud Capital, and Matt Kobe is the Vice President of Business Strategy and Analytics with the Chicago Bulls. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you, Bram. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Bram. Thanks for having me. That will do it for us this week. As always, the future is now. This is the Future Sport Podcast. I'm Bram Weinstein. The Future Sport Podcast is brought to you by 3 Advanced, developers of sports tech apps that are AI-powered and UX-focused. So if you're looking to create some apps for your startup or your sports biz calls for some artificial or business intelligence, you should check out 3 Advanced. They're incredible. Go to 3advanced.com. That's the number 3advanced.com. <laughs>